Greetings, Shaler area. This is Unit 1 Note Video Number 7. We are now going to talk about some elements. So Part 2, Section 2, is about classifying matter. How do we organize, classify, and model all of this matter that we are discussing in the world? Well, at its most basic, basic form, we consider an element to be a pure piece of matter. So an element is a pure material made from just one of the substances on the periodic table. And if you didn't know, this is a periodic table. And a periodic table shows all of the elements that make up everything in the entire universe. It's pretty crazy to think about how you can take everything as varied as the different planets and moons and comets and and forms of life that there are in the universe and break them down into a common set of roughly a hundred things. It's wild. So each one of these elements is made up, um, it looks like these, this is, this is the model of an atom, it's the model of one of the atoms in the periodic table and uh, you can see here that it is oxygen and it has eight protons, which are these little plus symbols, eight neutrons, which are the little yellow balls, they don't have a charge, and eight electrons, which are shown out here. We're going to learn a lot more about protons, neutrons, and electrons in Unit 2. So if we just have one of these, it is called an atom. So an atom is a single piece of an element. So if I had a hunk of pure gold in my hand, I could say that I was holding the element gold. Now that hunk of gold is made up of a gazillion atoms. So if I keep cutting it in half and cutting it in half and cutting it in half and cutting it in half, it in half almost endlessly, eventually I'm going to get to just a single atom of gold. And then I wouldn't be able to cut that in half anymore. Because that's it. That's just one atom. That's a single piece. Now if we start joining atoms together, now we make something called a compound. So it's two or more atoms that are combined chemically. Now here is an interesting word, this combined chemically. What does that mean? Uh, we're going to learn more about this again in Unit 2. But when you join things chemically, you end up they actually end up sticking together and there's a part of that atom, that little part that we just saw, the electrons, that are that are interacting with each other. And when they join that way, when they combine with their electrons, they become a compound. So here we have a very famous compound. These are actually the exact same molecules. So we have a big atom of oxygen. Here we have a big atom of oxygen. And then we have two little atoms of hydrogen attached to it. Over here kind of looks like Mickey Mouse. But this is, yes, everybody knows, two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2, Oh, it's what we call water. And water actually has this triangular shape to it, and that is a really big reason why water has the properties that it has. Is it, It's the shape of the molecule. It's the shape of the compound. You're going to learn the further and further you get into science, you should have learned it last year when you were talking about genetics, that the shape of a material is pretty much the reason that it has the properties that it has. Um, if you actually get down to the, the shape of how all of the atoms are sticking together, I mean, that determines everything about, about all of its properties, the color, uh, if it's food, the taste, all that stuff. And genetics, when I mentioned, is that it's the shape of the string of amino acids that make the protein that actually determine the job that protein does in your body. So here's some other compounds. Um, so this is interesting because this attacks a, a mis misconception and confusion that students always uh, often have. So here's the water molecule that we were just looking at, the water compound. It's easy to tell that this is a compound because we have three atoms joined together. We have two atoms of hydrogen and one of, one of oxygen. This sometimes students struggle with a little bit because here we have two atoms of oxygen and here we have two atoms of hydrogen. Are these compounds as well? They are. Remember, a compound is what you call 
something that is made of two or more atoms joined together, not two or more different elements joined together. It's in a very important distinction. So since there are two atoms here joined together, you can see how they're joined with their electrons, like I mentioned. Um, this is a compound. This is actually a compound that all of you um, like a lot, because if you didn't have this, you wouldn't be alive. This is oxygen gas. So if we ever talk about oxygen gas, we're not actually talking about the O on the periodic table. We're actually talking about a compound that's made by combining two oxygens together. This is what we breathe. If we had three oxygens joined together, if there was another atom of oxygen on there, we would actually not have O2, we would have O3. And O3 is also a gas, it's called ozone. And uh, it's actually poisonous to us. If you breathe in too much ozone or even a little bit of ozone, you can die. It's not, not good for you at all. Uh, it actually kills lots of things. Sometimes we use ozone as a disinfectant uh, to kill bacteria and whatnot. Hydrogen gas, H2, is up here. You will rarely ever just find a single H or a single O floating around. They like to react with each other too much. Here we have something that's obviously now another compound. You can tell it's a compound because there are distinctly two different kinds of atoms joined together. So we have these big yellow atoms of, uh, of one element, and the little round red atoms of another. When we start talking about chemistry in Unit 2, you're actually going to learn why some of these are bigger than the others. But this is a compound that is joined by combining two elements in the periodic table. The big yellow balls are chlorine. The little red balls are sodium. Now, this is what makes chemistry awesome. We have these two elements. Let's talk about some of the physical properties of these two elements. Well, chlorine is a gas, and I don't know uh, if you're too familiar with it, but if you have a swimming pool, you're probably used to uh, at least thinking that you know about chlorine. But when I said it was a gas, I'm going to throw you off because you think chlorine is the little white powder that you dump in your pool. Not quite right. Um, but chlorine is a gas, and it's kind of a yellowish-greenish color of gas, and it is really, really poisonous. Chlorine is actually one of the main ingredients in something they used to use in World War I called mustard gas. Um, in World War I, I don't know if you remember your history much, but in World War I, oops, dropped the mouse, hold on. All right, sorry about that. In World War I, um, there was trench warfare. So you would go out in a battlefield and you would dig a big long trench and you would essentially hide in that trench and while the enemy was on the other side, World War I happened to be between us and we'll say Germany, and um, they had their trench dug in and you would kind of hide in that little hole and sometimes you would get up and charge at the other trench but there was the area in between that they just shot you down it was called no man's land. Well, w battles went on forever, like days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks and sometimes months and months and months and it actually got to the point where the winner wasn't the one that was like like shooting or outthinking the other the other side. The winner was the one who could survive longer without like water and things. Like it was it was horrendous. So one of the things that they started that they made was this stuff called mustard gas, which is now totally illegal in battle. Uh, all chemical warfare is illegal in battle now. But this was a gas that was heavier than air. It's more dense. That's what wow, that was really bad. It's more dense than air. So since it's more dense than air it'll stay along the ground and it'll creep along the ground. So they would throw out this mustard gas and it would seep down into the trenches instead of floating up and if you breathed it in it would just sear the inside of your lungs. It was awful. It's a horrible way to die but that's why they had gas masks and whatnot and then if it was in there and they didn't have gas masks then everybody would jump out of the hole and then the, and the, the enemy could see you. So chlorine, nasty, nasty, nasty substance. Sodium, you probably think you know what sodium is but you're probably wrong. Sodium is actually a metal. It's a silver metal and it's really soft. You could actually cut it with your fingernail. You could put dents in it with your fingernail or even cut it with a butter knife. And it is super, super reactive. If you dropped um, a piece of pure metal sodium about the size of a pencil eraser into a bucket of water, the chemical reaction that would take place, the explosion that would happen, um, is about the size of, of a M80. Um, one of those classic fireworks that kind of look like little tiny little sticks of dynamite. So it's a really big explosion. What happens is the, there's a chemical reaction that takes place between the sodium metal and the water and it gives off pure hydrogen gas 
really fast and lots of heat and it ends up igniting the hydrogen gas and exploding. So here we have a compound that is made from atoms of an element that will kill you if you breathe them in and atoms of a, of a gas and atoms of a silvery metal that explode if you put them in water. Well, what kind of a compound do we get if we mix together an, a, a water exploding metal and a poisonous, poisonous gas? You mix them together and you get NaCl, sodium chloride, which we normally just call salt. Think about that. This is what makes chemistry awesome. You have these physical properties of the, of the individual ingredients, and then you have the chemical properties that can change the material. So when you mix together elements, you don't just get combined properties of the individual elements. You, when you make a compound, you actually get material with brand new properties, and sometimes properties that have never been seen before on Earth. It's what makes chemistry really interesting as like a field, because what chemists do is they try to create new materials and see what properties these new, these new materials have and if they have new interesting properties try to figure out what you can actually do with them to make technology better. It's a really interesting field. You don't sometimes even know what you're going to get by combining things together. Sometimes it's really bad, sometimes it's beneficial. And as we've learned about science, most of the time probably not beneficial. So there is a little video I'm going to show here. Um, so you can actually see this chemical reaction take place between the metal and the gas. I will warn you, the video is horribly, awfully boring. It's like a, like a, uh, I don't know, like one of those Ben, ben Stein kind of science videos. Maybe it'd be kind of like one of those science videos that you might have watched in Mr. Alexander's class. That was a joke. All right, here we go. Going to get it to play. So you're going to see, um, here we have uh, a flask, and let's do it on here. Here we have a flask, and in the flask is, you can kind of see the gas. It's like a greenish, yellowish gas that's in there, and then you have this pipe coming down. And at the very bottom of this glass pipe is stuck a piece of sodium. And they're going to knock the sodium off, so the sodium is sitting inside of here and then they're going to cause a chemical reaction to take place between the sodium and the gas by putting a drop of water down and causing the sodium to react with the water. And what you're going to see in the end is a really bright flash that's the actual chemical reaction of the metal joining with all of the gases that's in here, all the chlorine gas that's in here. And you're going to see like a white cloud. And that cloud in the end is pure salt. It's a salt cloud. It's pretty neat. A small piece of sodium metal is placed in a flask containing yellow chlorine gas. The flask also contains sand to prevent the heat which will be generated by the reaction from cracking the glass. Initially, no reaction is observed between the sodium and the chlorine. The reaction will be initiated by adding a drop of water to the sodium. All right, back to the power. Hope you enjoyed the video. So what happens if you put two things together, but they're not joined chemically? I mean, this is what mostly happens. If you shake someone's hand, you haven't joined chemically. If you throw your books into your book bag, it's not like they're joining chemically. You can still pull your math book and your science book out. <clears throat> it's not like you're pulling out a, like a brand new English book that came out of nowhere. So anytime you put things together and they're not actually joining together, we call this a mixture. And there are two types of mixtures, and here we go, big science words. We have homogeneous mixtures, and if you remember from last year in genetics, when you were talking about 
homozygous alleles, or you were talking about um, like hetero, heterogeneous and, and, and homogeneous uh, genetics. Well, homo is a Greek prefix that means same. So if it means same, these are two ingredients, if mixed together, that look the same. And it can, not, it can be more than two, it could be ten. But if they all look the same, you look at it, it's a substance just looks like it's one thing. It's not obviously a mixture. We call this a homogenous mixture. And a good example of something like this, I used to put out a dish of this in the class and have the kids try to figure out what it is, um, is salt and sugar. You mix together salt and sugar, it just looks like a pile of white powder. Um, but if you taste it, you can still taste the properties, the individual properties of the individual crystals. So the salt crystals will fire the salt receptors on the tongue. The sugar crystals will fire the sugar receptors on the tongue. Sometimes it's a really odd combination and people kind of smirk or turn up their nose at it. Even though, you know, people like both of them independently. So other examples of homogenous mixtures, milk is a great example of, of a homogenous mixture. So in milk you have like water and fat and oil and protein and all this stuff that's all mixed up to look like one creamy white fluid. And actually if next time you go to lunch, um, look at your carton of milk and there will be a word on it that looks a lot like this. It doesn't say homogenous, but it might say homogenized. That means it's been all mixed and shaken up so that it has become a homogenous mixture. If you ever wanted to separate them, um, it's kind of we kind of think of it as gross, but if you let moi if you let milk spoil, it will separate back out into its original ingredients. We call that the, how the milk gets like chunky or sour, um, and you'll see like a clear liquid separate, and you'll see like hard like harder white globs form. And that's the fat joining up into, into like a ball and the, and the clear whey. Uh, if you've ever heard of um, the Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. The curds are what they call the chunky parts and the whey is what they call the clear fluid. You can do this artificially. The reason it separates is actually a chemical reaction that takes place um, with acid. So if your milk is spoiling, it's because you got bacteria in there. And as the bacteria are actually eating the milk, like floating around on dust in the air, for example, as the bacteria is actually eating the milk, it is giving off waste. So you can think of the bacteria as like peeing into the milk. And the, that waste, that, that bacteria pee, is acidic. And when enough of that builds up in the milk, the acid causes all of the parts of the milk to separate. You could do this artificially if you want and see it happen really fast. If you pour yourself a small glass of milk and shoot some lemon juice in it, um, it'll curdle right there. Uh, you can kind of watch it. It'll, it'll all separate. The other kind of mixture is called a heterogeneous mixture. Now, please note the spellings on these. Heterogeneous has like an extra E in it. I'm going to back up. See, homogeneous, heterogeneous. So there's an extra little e, on, e in there. Just pay attention to that, especially when you're working on the crossword puzzle. So if homozygous means the two of the same alleles and heterozygous means two different alleles back in genetics, homogeneous mixture is when they look the same and a heterogeneous mixture is when they look different. Heterogeneous mixtures are really easy to pick out because you can obviously tell that there's more than one thing mixed together. Good examples are things like salt and iron filings. I would set out a bowl of this too. So you could tell if you look in it that it's black and white. Kids want to taste it because they thought the other one was salt and, and sugar, so this one must be salt and pepper and totally not the case. Couldn't eat this one. But as you, I would set this out because I wanted to prove a point. The thing about compounds is once you've joined the atoms together to make a compound, you can't separate them unless you do another chemical reaction. If you put items together to make a mixture, mixtures can always be separated from each other. So you don't have to do a special chemical reaction because the materials aren't changing. You're just pulling them away. You're teasing them away from each other and, and kind of purifying them. So you could separate the salt and the iron filings by taking advantage of the properties of each of the two things. So think about some way that you would, if, you, if I gave you a cup of salt and iron filings, you could separate them so that you had salt left and separate from iron filings. So what is something that salt can do 
that iron filings cannot. The first thing that students sometimes say is salt will dissolve in water and iron will not. So you could take a glass of water and pour it into that dish, all the salt would dissolve, and then how would we still get the salt and the iron away from each other? Well, you did a lab just like this down in Scott Avenue. You'd pour the liquid through something like a filter paper or a tissue paper, um, and that would collect all of the iron filings. You'd let those sit, sit aside and dry, and then you would have all the water still, and you would let the liquid evaporate, and left in the dish would be salt. You could also take advantage of a physical property of iron that salt doesn't have. It's magnetic. So you could take a bar magnet and dunk it down in there, and all the little metal pieces would stick to the bar magnet, pull it out, and then you would have salt left in one and iron left in another. So any mixture, it doesn't matter what it is, you can always separate um, the materials based on their, their physical properties. Even a homogeneous mixture, like we talked about uh, with milk, but even like, a, like salt and sugar, if you were to look at those two crystals under a microscope, salt crystals are perfectly cubic. Um, you actually saw that in the picture of the molecule of sodium chloride. There, that's actually how the crystal looks. It looks like a cube. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until you can see it. While sugar crystals don't look cubic. So you could actually separate it if you had a lot of time on your hands, a microscope, and a really, really tiny pair of tweezers. You could go one grain at a time and separate the mixture of salt and sugar into two piles of salt and sugar. So heterogeneous mixtures... Trail mix, bouquet of flowers, you look at that, you can definitely see that it is a bunch of things mixed together. Now there is a special kind of homogeneous mixture, and this is one we call a solution. Now a solution is a special type of homogeneous mixture when one substance is dissolved into another. And the two substances that we have in a solution are a solute and a solvent. Now, if you remember from seventh grade, the uh, water, the nickname of water, is called the universal solvent. So pretty much you can think of um, any, if you're talking about a solution where you have a solid dissolved into a liquid, the liquid is going to be the solvent. And since we typically think of water as a liquid, that makes it easy to remember that water is the solvent. So it is what the solid gets dissolved into. Now when something gets dissolved, sometimes kids um, have a, they don't quite know what that means. They say it, they use it, but when you're talking about what's actually happening atomically, um, and like what's that, like if you ask students to explain, all right, so where does the salt go when you dissolve salt in water? The very common response is, it just disappears, or it goes into the water. Well, if you think about it, how can it go into the water? We just saw that water is that molecule made of three atoms. It looks kind of like a triangle. Are you saying that the salt is going into that, that, that triangle of water? No, that, that, that physically doesn't make any sense. It's already on, like an atom. You can't squeeze another atom into that one. And in fact, the sodium is even bigger, so it's trying to squeeze it in wouldn't make any sense at all. What happens is water, remember that triangle shape? So we have this like triangle shape of water. Well, when you get a whole bunch of them like a glass, they don't fit perfectly against each other because they're triangles. And you end up with spaces in between them. So you have tiny, tiny little spaces actually in between the water molecules, gaps. And those gaps are where the crystals end up going when something dissolves into water. They fill up all those little gaps. And then when all the little gaps in between are, are filled up, so when these are all, like you can't fit any more salt crystals in, in here, then we say that it is saturated. And then none of the salt crystals can dissolve anymore and the sugar just sits at the bottom. Like if you've made iced tea and you put a bunch of sugar in there and sugar starts sitting at the bottom rather than dissolving, that means you've filled up all the little gaps between the water molecules and well, I guess there's tea in between the water molecules as well. And now you've filled the red gaps up the rest of the way with, with sugar and when all the gaps are filled, it's, it's been saturated. Now, solutions are, can also occur between other phases of matter. Like you can have gases dissolved in other gases. You can have gases dissolved in water. It doesn't have to just be solids. Um, so whatever is disappearing and going 
into something else is the solute. Whatever you can see when it's all done is the solvent. And that leads us to the next booby trap. There are 10 questions. Good luck.